So I'm uh, Tony Lemieux, uh, the uh, founding co-director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center, and thank you so much for being here, for participating in this discussion. Um, it's being recorded, so we'll be able to, to be followed up on um, online, and, and uh, we really appreciate your participation. And thank you, Jennifer, for joining all the way from, from Turkey. So uh, our session, Depol Depolarizing Democracy, uh, bringing citizens closer at the local, state, and national levels. Um, is going to be moderated by Ryan, Ryan Carlin, the professor of political science and the director of the Center for Human Rights and Democracy. Um, an esteemed colleague is going to take it away. So. Thank you, Tony. All right, again, welcome and thank you so much. Um, Tony said I had to do a, a panel, and he said, it's about the UN, de UN Development Goals. I said, I don't even know what those are. He said, go look them up. Everything fits. So one of the UN Development Goals is governance. And I said, OK, I think I can handle this. And uh, so I chose affective polarization because here at Georgia State, we have a, a really strong cluster of folks that, that work on this, especially Dr. Jennifer McCoy. Uh, and, and so. Let's just talk, I think everybody here probably knows what this is about. Effective polarization at, at a very base level is about uh, the extent to which rival partisans dislike each other. And, um, and so that means Democrats, maybe they don't like Republicans and Republicans don't like Democrats. Of course, this goes beyond the United States. Um, but it poses a, a huge risk to democracy uh, and governance because you risk eroding things like empathy for each other at, at the societal level, mutual respect, uh, your willingness to compromise, your willingness to cooperate. To the extent that that message is taken up in, uh, in our institutions, it can ping around and wreak havoc. Just like when social groups uh, that aren't necessarily political don't like each other, there may be a risk for social conflict. You know, when, they, when, when political groups uh, lose respect for each other, we're going to get conflict within our democratic institutions. Welcome. So we've looked into this, uh, especially uh, Dr. Bacoy here, and uh, you know we've shown that it, the scholarly consensus is that this is pretty bad. It's actually bad. For, it, it's 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 extensive. There is extensive affective polarization not only here but elsewhere, and it tends to hurt democracy and threaten all kinds of norms like accountability, like trust, like. Um, uh, yeah, compromise those sorts of things. So, um, where did it come from? People have a lot of ideas, but in the United States, there was a sense that it was preceded by what we call the big sort. The big sort says, a long time ago, it used to have people who would identify as Republican, but they, but they would also identify as liberal or towards the liberal end of uh, middle of the scale. Uh, and at the same time, you would have people who identify as Repub Democrats, but they might identify also on the ideological scale is more conservative or more in the middle. So um, when, so, when political, uh, social media came up uh, and 24-hour news, um, people started getting more pure, uh, purer ideological uh, understandings of what it meant to be a Democrat, what it meant to be a Republican. And so this led to the death of the blue dog Democrat, the death of the New England Republican, and so on and so forth. So. So we've had a big sort. We're now Democrats are liberal and conservatives are uh, um, Republicans are conservatives. Similar things have happened elsewhere. It's less obvious how to address this, and that's why I uh, took off. That's why I, you know, invited people who have been in the trenches uh, in this in practical politics here in the United States, here in our state, uh, and internationally. And so we've got really a uh, a, 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 a panel that is. Um, Quite a, quite a luxury for us here today. So I'm going to get out of the road here. I want to hear about, I'm going to ask the panelists here to, to talk a little bit about their own experience uh, with, um, with, with uh, polarization in, in their own work. And, um, and then we're going to have a handful of, uh, of questions for guided Q&A. So I'd first like to welcome, from Istanbul, Turkey, Jennifer McCoy, professor of political science at Georgia State and non-resident scholar in the Democracy, Conflict, and Governance program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. So Jennifer, if, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about your own work, uh, where you encounter polarization, 
Uh, and um, how does it make your job more challenging? And then we'll pass the microphone to someone in the room. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thanks, Ryan. Yes, well, I am a professor at Georgia State, and as Ryan said, I am actually work, working on uh, researching this problem and um, investigating it and also looking for solutions. I hear a lot of feedback. I'm not sure if are you all getting that as well. It's not, it's not as bad as you think. Okay. Um, and so, uh, you know, like right now I am in Turkey. And we see this, uh, they have an election coming up on May 14th, and it's a very polarized country, and it is going to be very exciting to be here to see this. And they're actually posing this as a, uh, the, the opposition to the current government is posing this as a choice between democracy and authoritarianism. And we've seen polarization here, um, divisions on uh, whether the country should be more religious or should it have a more secular view of religion. Oh, that sounds much better. Thank you. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I'm witnessing, experiencing, and studying this now in Turkey. In the United States, um, of course, we've been seeing it really for the last 30 years. It's been growing. And I see it all the way from our national government where it's extremely difficult to make decisions, as Ryan was talking about. Uh, Congress gets grid gridlocked a lot, but all the way down to relations between neighbors and in families. And I hear from my students, in fact, about anxieties communicating with friends and relatives. I teach some classes about it, and we've discussed it. And they have really appreciated getting tips on how to communicate across the divide for when they go home at holidays, for example, and have relatives with all kinds of different perspectives. Uh, that can be kind of uh, tense and intense encounters. So right now, I've uh, already written quite a bit on the problems, diagnosing the problem, the causes of polarization. Now I'm working on a book on how to overcome it, which is really a lot more difficult than diagnosing the problem. So we can talk more about that in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm on mute. Um, I'd like to welcome Ms. Andrea Young the Executive Director of ACLU of Georgia. Thank you, Andrea. I'd love to hear about how you see polarization in your work. Great. Um, thank you uh, very much. I'm uh, really pleased to be here, and I'm, I'm here as much to learn. Uh, am I? Oh, okay. Shouldn't I hear me? Okay, great. Uh, as much to learn um, as anything. Um, Jennifer and I often have these discussions about polarization. Uh, I'm the head of the ACLU in Georgia, which some people would say is itself a polarizing uh, organization. Um, we, are, um, we envision a state that guarantees all persons civil liberties and, and rights uh, contained in the United States and Georgia constitutions and the Bill of Rights. Uh, pursuing that agenda uh, turns out to be quite controversial in this in the state of Georgia and increasingly controversial, you know, um, across the country. Um, we, we operate on five core values in, in our affiliate. We're 60 years old. We've been very active in Georgia. Mar in fact, Marjorie and Ralph Knowles are among the um, uh, real contributors to the growth of the ACLU in the South. R Ralph founded um, the ACLU in Alabama. and. Marjorie, when I became uh, executive director of the ACLU, was one of my big supporters and was very generous in supporting our voting rights work um, here, here in Georgia. Um, but you know, our values are liberty and justice, democracy and patriotism, nonpartisanship, equity and inclusion, and integrated advocacy. Um, but increasingly, being an advocate for, you know, for individual rights and liberties uh, is seen somehow as being partisan. Uh, and so when we fight for women's reproductive freedom, when we complain about voting rules that make it harder for African Americans and other people of color to vote, you know, that is somehow seen as, um, as, as partisan. And so we work, you know, very, we work on issues um, not based on party, but as Jennifer has just pointed out, the parties have sort of taken this division 
Now, I don't feel like it's that benign. <laughs> um, I think, you know, the original sin of America is race. Uh, and so the, the parties have sort of completed this process where the Republican Party was, you know, in the Civil War era, you know, the party of uh, abolition. And sort of over time, we finally have resorted so that now the Democratic Party is sort of the multiracial democracy party, and the Republican Party has become the party of white nationalism and white grievance. Um, and so that's very much rooted in our history. Um, and, you know, I increasingly feel, I know if you saw the, the young men who were evicted from the state legislature in Tennessee uh, for representing their constituents on gun control issues, um, you know, it's very reminiscent of what happened after uh, the, the Reconstruction era of the Civil War when in Georgia, 33 African-American legislators were evicted uh, for being black. And so I think we, when we talk about polarization in our context, you know, we, we have to understand it with that, that sort of foundation of still, you know, sort of still wrestling and fighting over whether or not um, this is going to be a multiracial democracy, and of course, if it's not a multiracial democracy, it's not a democracy. Um, and so that's kind of our challenge and sort of our, our frame, the frame that I have, uh, and very much our work is, is focused on making voting easy for every citizen. Um, and by easy, I mean if you work two jobs and take the bus, you should find it easy to vote. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the focus of our work and in trying to put forward just that kind of very basic agenda, we have a lot of resistance um, in the context of, uh, of Georgia. So looking forward to, uh, and actually in, in thinking about this, I actually did, I, I do have some theories about strategies that, that overcome polarization. I don't know that they're depolarizing, but they, I think they overcome some of the effects of polarization. So I look forward to that part of the conversation. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'd like to welcome Mr. William Bill Barrow to, uh, to the stage. Bill is a national politics reporter and former Neiman Fellow at, from Harvard. Uh, he's now a national politics reporter for the AP based here in Atlanta. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Ryan. Um, there's, it, it, it's interesting to hear so much overlap in uh, how we all look at this, regardless of whether we're sitting in academia or in advocacy or in, in journalism. We're kind of all looking at the same thing from a different angle. Um, and I come from an industry where quite literally from the beginning, in your very first news writing class, you were taught that one of the core defining uh, components of judging newsworthiness is conflict. Um, and I, I can't necessarily argue against that, but it very easily, and I think demonstrably has, morphed into something that is absolutely a contributing factor to the polarization that we, that we have. And I start with that in, inward reflection on journalism because it's just so obvious how ubiquitous that, that framing is. Politics coverage in particular in the United States is framed so often by the scoreboard, and that's the starting point. We've quite literally given jersey colors to our two major parties in this country as if people with my role are sitting in a stadium press box covering a game. Um, and that is, that's deeply frustrating to me the older I get and the longer I've done this. Um, because we extend those broad brushes that, that really just trace back to explaining the electoral college map on election night, that's where red and blue came from, but we extrapolate that and define every issue that way. We paint whole states and whole regions that way. We define individual policy debates that, that way. And that's damaging to democracy. Now, I do want to point out, just I took a quick spin, not, nothing that would compare with, with what our PhDs in the room do, but I revisited some of the summaries of some literature over the last decade, went back through some of my bookmarks that I always save from Pew Research, and reinforced the idea that the media uh, is really not a root cause of polarization. 
we reflect it. That's where that conflict comes in. Like it is justifiable that we cover conflict because it does exist. Um, but where my industry, I think, has to do better is more honestly wrestle with how we exacerbate conflict and how we focus on it to the point of overemphasizing the full makeup of the electorate and the citizenry and where it is. Because the academic literature also, over the last several years, even in this era of rising nationalism, rising populism, sectarianism in the United States and around the world, we'll find that we're, we're not actually, if you dive into the, a lot of public opinion, quite as purely polarized as the discourse might seem, as the media narrative seems, as two-party elections seem. Um, and, and I raise those distinctions in, in this discussion today just to say there's a lot of angles, a lot of ideas, and a, no single root cause, and thus no single fix for this. That said, just coming from my business, I wanted to introduce a few ideas really quickly, and we can, if we want to take the discussion there, when it's my turn, I can go more in depth there. But I've had a range of ideas, ranging from the very simple to the more complicated, uh, on how we can do better. And one is just to simply stop, and the Associated Press could take the lead on this, is to stop using red and blue as objective modifiers. It's a very sim simple nomenclature thing. But because we do that in American newsrooms, it affects every other coverage decision after that because we have chosen to simplify the way we see everything. So I just want that to stop as a first step. That would extend to, on the more complicated side, with the demise of local journalism, the national networks, the national papers, New York Times, Washington Post, the Associated Press, are that much more responsible for carrying the narrative. That's not going to change in this business environment. What does have to change is that organizations like ours have to spend more money and more resources out around the country and not just through parachute journalism. I mean actually basing more and more people and not just entry-level reporters out around the country instead of just in Washington and New York because you can't, those places are bubble, everywhere's bubble. Human, humans are, we're tribalist by nature, right? And so we need to like fight the, the bubble syndrome that is that much more um, a dangerous variable when local journalism and journalism close to the ground is just withering on the vine. Um, and then related to all of those, the red and blue change and, and redistributing resources is just redefining what we call political reporting. Uh, because in my business, I'm a political reporter, and what that really means functionally is I'm a campaign reporter. And I don't want to do it that way anymore. Campaigns are important. But we, politics is simply the way we organize society and make the rules, quite simply. Politics is not inherently bad, inherently evil. But we just cover the campaign aspect of it and don't link, uh, I think, broadly uh, to the policy, to the people on the ground, to the forces that, that move up and down and affect, affect the power. So I want to, uh, just a kind of fundamental redefinition of what it is to be a politics reporter or a politics team at these big organizations. So anyway, those are just some ideas to kind of get you started from my vantage point, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Bill. All right, we've already jumped to solutions. Yeah, Darn it. Uh, you, you get to go to the penalty, pe penalty box for three minutes, Bill. Uh, <laughs> and now I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Bill Bozart of, uh, of Better Ballot, Georgia. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Ryan. Um, having heard my other panelists speak, I think I may change what I plan to say. I, I think I compliment the other folks on the panel by perhaps being the quintessential involved individual. I'll trace a little bit of my history in terms of my advocacy, if I will. Um, maybe the first 40 or 45 years of my life, I was apolitical, which is not un unusual. I was raising a family. I was trying to build a career. And at some point, I looked around, and, and I thought the system was really screwed up. And there's lots of, lots of faults in our democratic process. There's no question about it. And I looked around to who was going to be 
responsible for making that better. And of course, there is no cavalry coming. Uh, if you want to make the system better, you've got to invest in it. So I began a journey. Uh, I first started helping candidates get elected and locally. Um, all those years that I, that I was a, sort of like in the background, I did vote for president every four years. I knew who my senators were. I probably knew who my congressman was. Maybe I didn't, but certainly at the local level, my city, my county, my state representatives, I didn't know any of those people. And one of the things I began to realize is the decisions that get made at that level have more of an effect on our lives than anything that happens in Washington, D.C. Going back to what Bill said, if we're not looking at what's happening out in the, in the uh, boondocks, we aren't really understanding the, the, the democratic process that is the United States of America. So I, I started getting involved with candidates, but then I quickly discovered it's not so much getting the right person elected, it's what they do once in office that's important. So I began to talk about the process of government, or think about it, and tried to think how I could make a difference in that area. Uh, one of the jobs I had for eight years, I was the executive director of Common Cause Georgia, which is a well-known national organization, and I was head of the Georgia chapter. And we were just trying to make government work better for the people. There's lots of special interest knocking on the door at City Hall, at the state legislatures, in the capital city in, in Washington, D.C. But Common Cause was founded in 1970 by a man named John Gardner, who was a great, brilliant mind in, in those days. He, he was in the Johnson cabinet, even though he identified as a Republican. Uh, he was one of the people that was instrumental in so many institutions that are there today, like the Medicare program. He was there to found that in the 1960s. Once he got out of government, he founded our organization because he thought there needed to be somebody advocating for the, per the people. Everybody in Washington had somebody lobbying for them and getting paid big bucks to lobby, but nobody was there speaking on behalf of all of us. So that organization was in that space initially by itself. Today, there's many organizations that try to do that. So I worked with them for eight years. I was a lobbyist down at the Capitol. Uh, Andre, you'll be, get a kick out of this. They were, there was, a, there was a place where the good guys stood, the people that were advocating for the kinds of things we're talking about here, and there was another part of the Capitol where the lizard loafers lobbyists <laughs> that were representing all the special interests would hang out. And I also say the League of Women Voters were there, ACLU was there, and Common Cause was there. Common Cause was trying to legislate. Uh, the uh, League of Women Voters focused primarily on educating, and the, the ACLU focused on litigating. So the three of us were sort of there trying to make the system better uh, for everybody in different ways. Um, the organization I represent today is called Better, Better Ballot Georgia. I sort of came out of retirement to work on that one because it's one I think we can get done very quickly. It's, it's an advocate right now for the option of ranked choice voting or what we call instant runoff voting in our elections. It's a very small piece of the of the pie, but if we could get improvement there, we can get improvement on the other system. Let me close by just making a quote, and I kind of stole this from one of the representatives. I think it was from uh, an organization called Fair Vote, which is uh, at, active nationally for, for, the, uh, for the cause of ranked choice voting. All of our choices within our electoral system are crucial, and when we make any changes or select any particular method for local, state, or national elections, we are selecting a set of values and a philosophy of government, as well as a range of accompanying effects and externalities. Once you internalize the full import of this knowledge, you realize it's quite revolutionary. So to summarize what I just said, the way that we define our system, and if we can tune that and make it better, we're going to address some of the problems of polarization that we're talking about here today. So I look forward to expanding on that as we get more into it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, you know, I'm just, I have to thank Jennifer for helping me put together this panel. It's, I didn't know uh, Andrea or Bill, and, uh, and, and these were great suggestions. We just have such a nice range of, of media. We've got advocacy, we've got legal, uh, and academic. So thanks again, Jennifer. This is a, this is a really amazing um, forum in which to discuss these issues. So I'm going to go out of order. Um, and, and I'm going to ask um, Andrea to come speak next and you know, tell us a little bit about some of the ways that you found and you kind of alluded to maybe some overcoming, maybe not depolarizing, but overcoming nonetheless 
uh, a polarization in, in the work that you do. So come on up. Thank you. Well, it, um, thank you. Am I uh, off mute? Okay. I, uh, you know, so it's interesting as I was thinking through this, I said, well, we don't, we're not really in the depolarization business. We're, you know, in the winning business, right? So, you know, we go into a legislative or if we take on a, you know, elect or an issue campaign uh, in, a, um, in, in, in an election, you know, we want the criminal justice reform candidate to win, right? And um, they, and, and if we're in the legislature, um, I think, you know, pro probably in the legislature there is a lot more of, for us, a lot of harm mitigation. I mean, there are, you know, I think one, one good result that we came up with in trying to mitigate uh, some of the problems with uh, the reaction to, you know, the, the massive turnout in 2020, the legislature came back and made it more difficult to vote. We, d we were able to say, Chris Bruce... Bill was able to say, well, um, uh, they wanted to get rid of, of weekend voting, and so the, we said, well, it's not, uh, it's not fair. There's so many you know, working people and can't vote during the week. And so actually the, uh, one of the, I think the, the, the chair sort of came back and said, well, what if we did a second mandatory Saturday? And we said, yeah, well, that's good. We'll do a second mandatory Saturday. So that was one of the ways that kind of really trying to say, what is the interest here and what is the... So I think focusing on, you know, focusing on interests and values and, you know, what is it that is, you know, trying to find common cause uh, as we talk about policy changes. But I also think we, we saw, tr you know, I grew up in the civil rights movement that the technique of creative nonviolence is is something that helps to overcome polarization. Um, that when you think about the if the time of you know the Birmingham movement, the time of the Selma movement, you know was a time when you know racism was not only uh, acceptable; it was like the law, right? And so enforced by you know in, with the full force of law. And so those movements were able to dramatize, you know, the, the harm and create change. And I think we recently saw that with um, the George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery um, situations and the peaceful, the overwhelmingly peaceful protests, although the media love to point out the three people who burned a car, you know, instead of the 30,000 people, you know, who, who um, you know, who, uh, protested peacefully and the kind of multi-racial protests, you know, that were global actually, not just in the United States, but they were everywhere and they were in small towns and they were in, and so people were really moved by what Dr. King called unearned suffering. And so the unearned suffering of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and the visibility of that because it was caught on video and this was one time when social media was beneficial and it spread this around the world. Um, and so we saw change and I, uh, we saw change result. We saw people uh, all across Metro Atlanta, including the, the exurbs and what we used to call the white flight suburbs, um, elected sheriffs and district attorneys that ran on a reform platform. Um, we saw even in Augusta, even in Savannah, um, you know, we saw, um, I mean, a, a young Morehouse graduate, I forget where he went to law school, I'm not sure if he went to Georgia State, but um, was elected district attorney in Augusta. And so, you, and so this is one of the things where, you know, where nonviolent protests, and I think we saw, you know, if you think about, you know, Prague Spring, you think about what's happening right now in Israel, that people who are, who, that stopped, you know, the takeover of the judiciary, that peaceful protest that dramatizes an issue, you know, can bring people together, and it, you know, and it, it is sort of, it's depolarizing, I think, in the sense that you're not creating an enemy. Dr. King says, you know, we don't seek to defeat people, we seek to transform them. And that nonviolence is also about respecting not only people's persons, but also their personality. And so it's not about, you know, it's never, it's not about demonizing people, it's not about 
Uh, but it is about telling your own truth. It is about dramatizing that truth and sort of, you know, appealing to, I guess, people's better nature and believing people have a better nature. I mean, and a lot of that we did in the Christian context and believing everyone is a child of God, and there is that in everyone, right? And uh, it's a little talk, you know, I don't, ha I don't talk about that so much in the ACLU context, um, although I, I say to folks that the ACLU is not against religion. We are for all religions, and we believe everyone should be able to practice their own religion, you know, sort of equitably, that there, that there shouldn't be preferences. Um, but we're, in fact, my organization, we have very religious people that are part of the ACLU of Georgia, you know, in, of, 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 of different, you know, of different faiths. Um, so I think, you know, I think that that is a, uh, you know, and also, you know, we, we repealed citizens' arrest, one of the few states in the country that have repealed citizens' arrest as a result of the um, Ahmaud Arbery um, uh, um, tragedy. And so I think that, you know, uh, that creative nonviolence and, you know, sort of massive um, vigils and, you know, people power, of, you know, people really standing up for, a, you know, against injustice in a peaceful, in a nonviolent way. So it's not just, it's not passive, but in this, but in a nonviolent way that dramatizes what the crisis is and what the injustice is, I think has been a, a, a technique that has allowed for uh, progress on social justice issues in a way that don't demonize the other side, but in fact invite them to invite them to change and gives them actually allows room for change because if you get into this you know the, when you get into a fight the only result of, of, is that one person will win and one person will lose whereas creative nonviolence offers an opportunity for everybody to move forward uh, move forward together that is wonderful thank you so much um, Does anybody want to comment or question? I, I, you just sat down, I know, but does anybody want to add a question right here and right now? Right. Yeah, we can take those mics right off the stand. Yeah. Does anybody want to ask a question right now? I mean, it occurs to me that like, if we just go all the way around and then people forget their questions, that would be tragic. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll we'll, we'll keep going. Um, Bill. Uh, Bill Bozar, why don't you come up and, and give us your thoughts here? I think you, I think I know where you're going with this, uh, and then we'll go to Jennifer and then Bill Barrow. Okay, thank you, uh, Ryan. Um, just to expand a little bit on what I was talking about earlier, um, if you look at the way we elect our officials, first of all, both at the congressional level and the state level. We divide our state up into districts. And in most states, there are some exceptions, but in most states, including Georgia, that process is controlled by the legislature. So the way that the lines are drawn for congressional districts, the way the lines are drawn for state representative districts and state senate districts are basically under the control of those two bodies. Um, and. The Republicans have had power in Georgia since 2005, and they have taken advantage of that by structuring both the congressional and the local districts such that they have very large majorities. I think the numbers in the Georgia House today, there's 180 people there. I think there's about 100 Republicans and about 80 Democrats. But you say, well, maybe that's reasonable, but look at what happens in the statewide elections. In 2020, uh, it was about 50-50 between Trump and Biden, with a few others drawn off by the other candidates. But it's pretty much of a 50-50 state. And we saw the same thing in the, in the runoff between uh, Herschel Walker and, and Raphael Warnock. So we're a 50-50 state, and yet our congressional uh, delegation is 9-5. And the reason that's the case is that the districts are drawn very much to favor the party in power. And before I dump all over the Republicans, I want to say that I was in common cause in the early 2000s when the Democrats held the good cards in the Georgia General Assembly, and boy, did they use that to their advantage. The big difference today is that the precision with which we can understand voter patterns and then draw the districts to accommodate those has gotten much more refined. 
The computers allow us to, we, we identify people in Georgia as Democrats and Republicans really in only one way, and it's kind of an imperfect way because all we know is which, which primary you chose to vote in. And if you vote in the Republican primary every time, the odds are you lean Republican and vice versa if you vote in the Democratic primary every time. That's all we know in terms of a household by household analysis. But there's people like me, and maybe I'm naive, but I try to look at the candidates and select the best candidate. And sometimes I will vote in the Republican primary because that's more important to me. And sometimes I will vote in the Democratic Party because it's more, more um, there's, a, there's a race there that I care more about. So I've seen some of the analysis that both parties do. And Bill Bozarth is seen as an I. <laughs> they, they sort everybody else. If you run for office as a Democrat, the Democratic Party will give you all this data about where your supporters are in your district. And the only data they have to go on is this voting pattern of which primary you vote in. We are fortunately a state in which you can choose which primary to vote in. You don't have to register as a Democrat or a Republican. That's a good thing, and I'm glad Georgia does that. Georgia actually does a lot of things better than a lot of other states, and I like to give them credit because most of the time I'm criticizing them for the places where they fall short, but that's one that's good. So you start with the way that you elect people by deciding what the districts look like. And as I said, they're very skewed by the party in power, and that's not the case in Georgia. It's happening all over the country. So what would be a remedy for that? Well, there are some places where we have quote, independent redistricting commissions. California went to that a number of cycles ago. As a matter of fact, I was reading an article that in some red, some in some blue states, to go back to your, uh, your reference, they've actually found a way to sort of get out of this partisan redistricting. And what happened in the state of California, for instance, as a result of that, Republicans got more seats in California just enough to create the balance in the House of Representatives. They say that, you know, Independent redistricting has backfired in those states that are democratically controlled that thought it would be a good idea. But long term, I think that's what we have to do. If we don't get away from the partisan gerrymandering in all the states, we're going to be hard pressed to solve some of the problems we're talking about here today. Okay, so that's one thing to talk about. The other thing is ballot access. Georgia has one of the worst records of ballot access for anybody, for, for any other state in the, in the country. And what I mean by ballot access is to be able to actually get on the ballot at all if you're not a Democrat or a Republican. Are there some advantages to letting other people on? Yes, there are. In my one foray into the attempt for public office in 2014, I actually ran for the Georgia General Assembly, and I decided to run as an independent. Because if you can kind of tell where I'm coming from, I don't really want to identify with either party. Now, I will say this, I voted Democratic in the last few elections because the Republican position in Georgia has become, to me, so untenable that I can't support many Republican candidates. I voted for a few, but mostly I'll vote Democratic now. Uh, and the reason for that is that there's been this shift. The Republican Party, for me, just doesn't represent what we talked about earlier, that sort of, you know, potential for the middle ground. So, but what I will say, and in, in trying to, I'm trying to ram, I'm rambling here, but let me try to get to my point is that we had a way to get third-party candidates and independents on the ballot easily, what, would, what effect would that have? Well, it would have the effect of giving a greater voice uh, to those, those who don't believe, if you will, in being either an R or a D. And it, it would have a moderating effect in the sense that it would bring people in the race. And if I want to win, maybe I, I have to appeal to some of the supporters of those other people. And that's where the concept of ranked choice voting comes in. If you don't know what ranked choice voting is, very quickly, you have four candidates on the ballot. Instead of casting your vote for only one candidate, you make your first choice, your second choice, your third choice, and your fourth choice. And if in like the recent Atlanta City Council and, and the mayor elections, the last time we had a mayor election in Atlanta, I think we had a dozen candidates on the ballot. And so... Typically, what we do is go to a runoff where only the top two get voted on. And, and, and if you have ranked choice voting, in my example of five candidates, you add up the votes at election time. If any one candidate has 50 percent, they win. No, for, no further questions. If no one has 50 percent, you take the last place candidate and you allocate their second choice votes to the remaining candidates. And you tally the votes again. Does anybody have a majority? Well, not yet. So then you eliminate the fourth candidate. 
and that results again in another recount. And finally, somebody is going to have the majority of the votes by not only getting the people who took them as their first choice, but the people who would prefer them if their favored candidate doesn't win. Now, are there some examples of where this has worked well? There certainly are. Uh, I don't know if you followed the election in Alaska. Alaska is one of two states that has implemented ranked choice voting on a, on a statewide basis. And, and they do a, what's called a final four. They have an initial election, and the top four people go to a final election in November, and it's done with ranked choice voting. The state of Alaska had not had a Democratic representative in Congress in its entire history. They had the same guy there for 50 years, and he passed away. There was a special election, and a woman named Mary Peltola, who is a native Alaskan, first time one of, one, one of that type of person been elected, she won in a runoff because, in the, in the instant runoff, because there were two other Republicans, one of whom was Sarah Palin, a name we all recognize as the vice presidential candidate uh, a couple of cycles ago. And there was another Republican, and the people who voted for the third place finisher, who was the other Republican, a good number of those didn't vote for Sarah Palin as a, as a backup, as you might expect, because she was Republican. They voted for Mary Peltola. So you now have somebody representing the state and the reason that she won is because she appealed to a broader base. And does that help get away from the polarization? Absolutely. So we think this is a small step we can take in Georgia. There was a bill in the General Assembly which didn't get very far in 2023, but it would have allowed cities to start using ranked choice voting. And that's where I think we can begin because most of the, the city elections are nonpartisan. You don't have the primary where in the, in the fall you either get, you know, one candidate that's going to be a shoe-in, uh, or you, you, you have a primary where the, the most radical candidate in the primary wins that seat, and then in the fall, because of the gerrymandering, they win the general election. So this is a technique to try to get around it. Is it a big deal? It is a small deal, but this is relentless incrementalism is the way you start to solve this problem. So that's why I sort of, as I said, came back into the game for a few years to try to be part of a team that's bringing this concept across Georgia. And our, our success in it so far, we've had bills in the General Assembly, but it's very clear that the Republicans and the Democrats are going to look at any change in the electoral process through the lens of, will it help me or hurt me? So we have to get around that, and the way we do that is we get hundreds of thousands of Georgia. so there's a, a grassroots movement that is so strong the General Assembly will be pressured to eventually pass it. So that's what I'm advocating for. Lots of other things we can add, and I'll wait until we have more comments to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, Jennifer, I'd like to hear from you, and, and I just would note that I'm going to come back to this um, you know, Andrea and Bill's comments are, are really showing us effective ways to 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 deal with um, political polarization. And I think Jennifer and, and maybe Bill Barrow to some extent will also talk a little bit more about the specific affective element of it between citizens uh, and, and and how that that matters. But I think I want to I want to come back in, your, in the Q and A. I'm going to ask Andrea and Bill a little bit more about how they think it what they're doing has an effect on the way citizens of different parties uh, deal with each other. So Jennifer, take it away. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, there's so much to say, it's hard to choose what to say. Um, I've loved all of the potential solutions and also the diagnosis of the problems um, that the others have said, and those are all on my list as well. Do you want to mute that again, Ryan? Um, just while I'm speaking. You just have to remember to unmute it later. Um, so I, I just, um, let me just pull back a minute and say that the U.S. is really off the charts among other uh, democracies around the world, particularly among the wealthier democracies like us, in terms of the depths of this intense polarization. And we are much more like Brazil and India, two other very large democracies, also multiracial and multicultural democracies that are also facing extreme polarization and democratic backsliding, democratic erosion, which the U.S. is as well. And I didn't talk about that so much, but you know, I do, I do agree with what Andrea said earlier. Um, and so it's going to take a multifaceted, 
all hands on deck approach solution to this problem because the 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 roots of the problems in the US are multifaceted. And some of them deal with, it goes back to the founding, there's four fault lines of polarization that we have found around the world and the US faces all four of them at once. Um, one is about the founding and it's how do we define who is a rightful citizen? Who's a member of the community? And from the very beginning, we had systems systematic exclusion of African Americans, Native Americans, and women as women as half citizens, the others as non-citizens. And uh, we have still to deal with the, you know, with the, the realization that we're a multiracial democracy. So over, so dealing with that, dealing with really rising income inequality and wealth inequality in this country over the last several decades, that's another thought line. Um, a third one is, what do we even mean by democracy and balancing out? And this gets to some of what Bill was just talking about. And that is about how, how do we decide who can represent us and how we're going to govern ourselves. And we have different visions of that. But we also have very unusual political rules and institutions when you look at democracies around the world. And the way we elect our representatives is one of those that Bill described. Most democracies don't just have a winner take all in the district, one member representing a district, so that 51% of the people feel represented and 49% don't. So I think we've got to solve that. And then the fourth one is about, we're divided over even how we view our responsibility to each other as citizens. And that has to do with a term called the social contract. All right, so what are we gonna do? What I wanna say, first of all, that it's um, polarization, affective polarization, and this larger political and partisan polarization that I talk about, that I call pernicious polarization when it gets to the depths that we have, includes this affective polarization at the citizen level. It starts at the top level, though. It's refined this in all the cases we've looked at around the world. It is top down. And it starts with political, ambitious political leaders, candidates, political wannabes, and often their allies, often allies in the media who amplify their messages and other you know, cultural allies, um, who, who know that to win, to gain power, an easy way to do that is vilification, demonization, divide people, and convince people who are anxious about something, have a good reason to be anxious about jobs, about you know um, cult cultural change, whatever they're anxious about. Politicians know that they can drive on that fear, that anxiety. They can also drive on resentment and anger and win elections. And they do that, they blame, they identify an enemy and blame them. And they often say, that is my political opponent or that party, that camp, that group of people, maybe it's immigrants, maybe it's the Chinese, whatever, but they blame somebody. And, and, and this is creating, um, and so the people don't start out that way, normal citizens, but it creates this suspicion, distrust, and dislike that is effective polarization. And they hear the messages. They even change their own positions on issues when they hear their, their political party because uh, change their position because they are, are so, have been you know, hearing over and over these messages that say belong to us and you know, belong to our party, or I, as the leader, am going to help you and you know, save you and get rid of those horrible people. And so this creates this psychological tendency to want to stick with your own kind, to be with like-minded people, and to avoid contact with the other. And because uh, it's not comfortable, and you eventually become suspicious of their motivations about you, dealing with you. And so we, we stop having contact. So what I uh, advise on that is, uh, first of all, be curious, be, um, reach out, be curious, ask questions of somebody who thinks differently, and try to get underneath 
their position on an issue and understand their values, their concerns, their fears, get down to deeper levels and you will often find common ground. So that's the first thing, be curious, reach out, listen. Second is to um, try to encourage at, the, at group levels, community levels, um, social groups that you're in, try and encourage uh, joint projects with other groups that represent you know, different ideas or different kinds of people or different races or different religions. Um, try, try and create joint projects. That's been found to often um, bring people together when they're creating something new. Um, and third has to do with the media on how to do this. There's been a lot of research about how correcting the misperceptions that we have about the other party and their intentions and you know what they're trying to do to us or to democracy or who they are. We have great misperceptions or what they think about a particular issue. Correcting that can often lower this affective polarization at the citizen level. Okay, so I think that those are at least three things that can happen at the citizen level. The real problem is none of that's going to work while we have this toxic political polarization at the elite level, at the political leadership level, whether it's in the state or in the nation. And that's where we have to change the incentives. So Bill was talking about incentives. And we have to change our tactics. It's, it's hard to change the, um, the incentives for these politicians um, and it's, it's fundamentally crucial to change the incentives so that they will, for example, in a winning campaign, if they you know, have ranked choice voting, the incentive is not to just aim to your base and tell them your far, far out extreme views and hype them up in their resentment and anger, but instead to reach out to a broader audience. That's one. But my overall conclusion is because, two, because it is uh, driven from the top, it's driven by choice. And it's driven by people who want to, for whatever their personal reasons, whether it's their own power, their own ambition, sometimes it's personal greed, we see this in a lot of countries, greed, or whether it's maybe they actually have a transformative vision. They're really trying to change the society. but they feel like they must come into power and stay in power and they use this polarizing strategy to do so. They make that choice. Therefore, they can make a different choice. And because it's choices, it's agency, that means by people, people can also change it. But it's going to take moral courage. It's going to take leaders willing to put the national interest above their own partisan interest and willing to uh, suffer accusations of being a traitor or a sellout to reach out and find others with courage who are willing to work together and, and change, change the messages. That's really hard to do unless we have this push from below that the speakers also talked about. And um, the push from below can be you know, the local NGOs grassroots um, pushing and organizing it's also the mass protest that Andrea talked about. And it is something, Andrea's example was perfect because it's what I call a transformative repolarization, what she called creative nonviolence, but around values and principles like justice and democracy. You can polarize around that without the vilification, without the divisiveness, but focusing on the difference between a principle of justice or democracy and its opposite and organize peacefully of course nonviolently but organize protest put massive pressure on that has been shown to change it's going to take a change in the media from what bill said um focusing on everything as who's a winner and who's a loser when we already have a zero-sum perception and we already feel like we're being threatened by the other side and we're gonna lose out completely because it's a winner take all election. Focusing on everything like that in reporting just exacerbates that. And it's, it's gonna take 
courage not only from political leaders, this can take courage from business leaders, religious leaders, um, cultural, social media influencers, everyone to, to speak out, to uh, call out anti-democratic behavior, unjust behavior, um, and to uh, press for change. So it's really going to take an all-out effort. If we have time to come back for one more round, I have examples of the big, bold kinds of changes that other countries have done. And here is, you know, what, what we've concluded when we're in as deep a problem as we are right now. Small incremental change is not going to do it. It's going to take big, bold, transformative change. And that's hard to contemplate, but, uh, but there are examples of countries who have done it. I'll stop there. Thank you, Jennifer. You put me in a difficult position to stop you right at that. Oh, I'm muted. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I almost just said, keep going. Um, and we might, I want to come back to you in the, in the first on the, on, the, on the next round through. Go ahead, Bill. Come on up. So um, Jennifer just touched on some of this, just how hard it is to figure out where, where to start. And you know, I might pick at something she said that I don't quite agree with. I, like, yes, we need transformational change, but I think history just teaches us that you can't, you don't sacrifice the possibility of incrementalism along the way at the expense of aiming only for transformational. Sometimes there's a, there's a process there. Um, and bringing that to what I, just the way I do, in, in my opening remarks, I know I got a little head and, and offered like some big ideas that are above my pay grade in journalism. But I want to give you some examples just of what I have tried to do in where I've been on the ground. I covered Joe Biden's campaign for the AP in 2020. It was a great assignment. It's also an example of what our problem is in the, in the business. I'm based in Atlanta. I'm part of our Washington bureau. I got that assignment, and I'm thinking, this is awesome. I think that guy's going to be the president. Because I lived in the South, I under, kind of understood the dynamics and thought the whole time, like, this guy's the clear favorite for the Democratic nomination. Going along the way, I realized the reason my bosses gave me that excitement, that assignment is, you know, I'm the white guy down in the South, cover the white old guy that's past his prime, the party's <laughs> moved to the left, he's got trouble with progressives, this party's going to nominate Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders. And I was like, no, they're not. <laughs> And, and again, just that school board and all of that. So, so what I tried to do covering that one, and I've gotten some pretty good arguments from my bosses over how we were covering that frame, how we were covering Biden, how we were covering the Democratic Party in relation to, to Trump as the incumbent. And, and so there's just those battles on the ground. And then I tried, I, I didn't always win, but in, in, in the form of just like an individual story on a day, I looked at a guy like Biden, not... I think this is a pretty fair framing of, of who he is. There's, there's kind of two different definitions of moderate, I think, and they get over, they, they get truncated into one, just one easy word. There are the, what I would call a Sandra Day O'Connor moderate, who truly is kind of in the middle of the spectrum, right? Doesn't have, is difficult to put as a staunch conservative or a clear liberal. And then there are people that kind of have a lean, an ideological lean and a preference, but they recognize what a representative democracy and a complicated federal system is, and that they can't just impose their vision on the world, right? I think a proper understanding of a politician like Joe Biden is that he's actually moved left over the years and is, I think, a mainstream liberal. His philosophy is a mainstream liberal. But he is a fundamental legislator who spent 36 years in the United States Senate. Before it was as polarized as it is, he's a deal maker. That's a different form of moderation. I tried to cover Biden with that understanding. An example is a specific story when Justice Ginsburg died late in the campaign. The easy frame to cover that story, right, is just the partisan fight. Mitch McConnell throws down the gauntlet. They're going to ram through somebody, and the Republicans that run the Senate are going to do the exact opposite of what they did when Antonin Scalia died in January of 2016. That's all true. Biden comes in. Faces he's already the nominee, clearly, because this is the fall, faces tremendous pressure from the left to endorse expanding the court, to 
just, you know, score, match Republican Mitch McConnell's scorched earth policy on the federal judiciary with the Democrats' version of the same. Biden doesn't do that. Biden positions himself somewhere in the middle, certainly points out the inherent objective hypocrisy of the way McConnell managed the situation. But he didn't go all the way to the left. So I tried to, just in writing those stories, not just lead with either Biden in a fight with McConnell or Biden in a fight with his left flank because he wouldn't endorse expanding the court, and just explain, and by the way, go into some of the history of how the court got, how it was so politicized, where Biden being a central player, because he was chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee in the 80s when a guy named Robert Bork was nominated by President Reagan and voted down by the Senate. And I, I know this is a little complicated, but I get to that point to bring up the idea of I try to fight against, in part of this red-blue framing, the, the easy false equivalency between the parties. And this court example is one, aside from just the McConnell flip-flop, is a common narrative from Republicans is, well, Democrats started this when they spiked Bork. They did this. If you go back and actually look at that, Robert Bork, I mean, you can objectively read the things that he wrote in the 50s and 60s and 70s. That guy thought Brown v. Board was a bad idea, like bad constitutional jurisprudence. There were Republicans that voted against Bork in the 80s. Biden voted against him, but Biden, as judiciary chairman, gave him a hearing. He got a vote. Biden advanced the nomination to the floor without recommendation. He didn't have to do that. He could have killed it in committee because Bork didn't pass committee. And then Bork got a full vote on the floor of the United States Senate, and he lost it. And so, yes, a the United States Senate, with Democrats in the majority, Joe Biden chairing the Judiciary Committee, spiked a Republican president's nomination. But do you know what President Reagan did? Does anybody know who he nominated? Anthony Kennedy, one of those moderates. Who, or who became a moderate, some version of one. Kennedy got a very quick hearing, full vote in the Senate. And I, off the top of my head, I'm not going to get this exactly right. I think he was confirmed 98-0. So did the Democratic Senate hold hostage a United States Supreme Court seat and deny a twice-elected Republican president his preference on the court? No. <laughs> they confirmed Anthony Kennedy. And I, I just traced that as like one story where I just dug in, and I was able to win on that one, the way that I framed Biden's coverage and used that to do not just an easy political scoreboard story about a Democratic nominee for president, but to explain and do explanatory journalism with historical context in that context of the final six weeks of a presidential campaign. And I just wanted to offer that kind of small example Besides the big stuff that I can't control, but I do have ideas about, that I just approach my job that way, uh, and that would bleed into pushing against the easy narrative, like Andrea mentioned, where, look, I could probably buy that a lot of most card-carrying members of the ACLU vote Democratic, but is voting rights really, does, do we have to label that as a partisan issue in a representative democracy? No. I choose as a journalist not to do it that way. And if somebody tells me that makes me a, you know, some flaming partisan that's not doing my job, I don't lose sleep over that. Because they're wrong. Anyway. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, Bill. I, I'd like to open it up. Um, what I'm happy about is that each of you um, kind of told us the main question that I was going to ask is like, where do we start? You know, and so we've kind of already touched on that a little bit. I want to hear um, what comments or, or questions we have from the audience to go to go with this. I'm going to pass the mic. So, to whom may I pass it? You know, you want to. <laughs> Nothing. Yes, sir. All right. There was a remark made about the media reflect, and I think the problem we've had in the last uh, 
10 years is that the, the media is fractured, which has cracks in it, but also uh, react to this. Which funhouse mirror would you like to see do the reflection? Um, that does re remind me, you know, I think, you know, particularly now with the Dominion uh, litigation, what we see also is that um, demonization is a business model, right? So, I mean, Murdoch is very deliberately, or, or his, his team, they very deliberately told lies about the 2020 election for profit. Um, I think you can say the same thing about, you know, Facebook and Twitter and how quickly it is to sort of go down a rabbit hole, you know, but, and they know that, that the way their algorithms work, you know, if um, you can very quickly, you know, go down this disinformation rabbit hole and that's all you, that's all you get. So I think we do have real problems with the profit motive um, in some of our largest companies that, that are, are, Force are using polarization as a business model, vilification, uh, disinformation, um, and you know that's a very difficult thing to address in you know our current um, congressional makeup because of the the partisan uh, gerrymandering. And you know I think it's you know probably um, something that at some point citizens are going to have to decide they're just going to have to boycott some of these. Vehicles because they don't they don't seem to be able to self police themselves um, and you know as a free speech organization but of course you're not free to yell fire in a crowded theater which is what these folks are doing now mm -hmm. you know it is very dangerous and people people are um, really suffering as a result of this of, and our democracy is suffering as a result of the intentional. Um, the intentional dis disinformation. That's really interesting. I, when you mentioned that, uh, I was just thinking about how quickly we've seen bipartisan support against TikTok, <laughs> um, saving our country in a different way. Go ahead. So I've gone a little late, so I'm not sure if this was covered, but um, just something I've kind of dealt with in my personal, and uh, doing some lobbying for certain um, bills and whatnot. Both talking to, and just on, in life in general, so that's talking to people just on the street or even talking to sitting members of um, like our local legislator. You'll have, um, you can say something that's completely factual, that's backed up by studies, et cetera. But then someone will just say, yeah, but this is happening. No, but that isn't happening. It could be a crime. It could be an LGBT issue. It could be anything where they don't have, act the numbers are against what they're saying but they'll just say, yeah, but this is happening. I have stories. And you realize after a while you're talking to somebody on, well, you're not even talking the same language. You're not even existing in the same spectrum. How do you bridge that? That's great. Yeah. Who would like to take this from the panel? You know, I mean, it's a, it's a major concern. I think we really saw it with COVID. You know that you know that that facts didn't matter for some for some viewpoints, and we saw we see it in the legislature. You know, in the classroom censorship discussion, you know, members of the of the of the legislature would say, "Okay, give us an exit. Like, what is the problem you're trying to, trying to solve with, you know, this classroom censorship bill, with this transgender sports bill, with, you know, and they don't have examples." Right, but it, it you know it is just and then, and also with the voting they don't have you know there in fact they have examples just the opposite that in 2020 in fact the electoral system in Georgia was amazingly accurate. Um, there is um, you know Raffensperger said that to former President Trump, and nevertheless they came back and passed re more restrictive rules because there was a perception that there was something wrong. Thank you very Can much. Can I add to that, Ryan? Uh, yes, please. I can't really tell what's going on down there. Um, yeah, it's some, sometimes, some people you're not going to convince, ever. Um, others, 
Uh, so then, then I think that the trick is to try to convince others, you know, in the room. Uh, and part of it depends on the messenger. And a messenger uh, who is more trusted by those suspicious people of, of what you're saying, the people who don't believe you, uh, a messenger who is more trusted by them, but who is also somebody who's reasonable and wants to actually, you know, is curious enough to look into actual facts, um, might, can be more persuasive or at least can be persuasive with others around that person. You know, if it's an individual you know, citizen, then you can try what I was talking about before, the, you know, a deep conversation, getting underneath, just asking questions. Um, but if it's a legislator, then that's more difficult and it's gonna really take um, isolating them or, you know, building up support among others uh, around them within the same uh, group. Thank you so much. I think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I was just going to add that, you know, one thing I think the media has made um, some progress on in the last couple of decades is the idea of fact checking. And I, I do think the mere fact that we had to create something and label it fact check was a little bit of an indictment on how we had been doing our job for a long time. I, I mean, I, I, I am good friends with the editor of PolitiFact, and they won a Pulitzer several, several years ago. It was well deserved, but again, a damning indictment on the rest of us. That was the first step. The next step is we've done, and I say this at AP, we've tried to do a more conscious Ryan, could job. you unmute? But was just talking about the fact check enterprise within within big media, um, Jennifer. And and the um, we've tried to do a more conscious job at AP. It's still inconsistent, but working the idea of fact checks into the actual stories quickly. An example from the Trump administration, you know, AP, you now just see them on your phone as alerts. That that goes back to when we were truly a wire service and we would send out bulletins. And the most common bulletin for more than a century was something the American president said. You know, President Lincoln says blah, 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 President Grant, President Roosevelt, you know, through all those people. And it took us, I think, too long into Trump's administration. But the first step was you know, Trump would say something, it goes out on the wire, we build it out, and the final version of a story, which might be anywhere from 60 or 90 minutes after a news flash to several hours, would be a pretty fair representation, have the fact, you know, the fact check idea up high, but we realized we've already given him what he wants. <laughs> He's gotten the headline out there. He's gotten the news alerts. And we actually made a decision at the very top level in AP that we would no longer just send news flashes based on what a sitting president of the United States said because he just was a serial liar. Um, again, it took us too long to get there, but that's just part of what we're dealing with. And that's just something that we've done as an industry, something I think all citizens can do. And I, the very fact that you're in this room tells me you all already do that. But shilling a little bit for, for, for my company here, I, we try not to exist in this world where we are easily placed on the spectrum, uh, the ideological spectrum. That doesn't mean we always get it right. We have our cultural biases. All old legacy media institutions based in the United States have still been run by white males for a long, long, long time. Uh, we are correcting some of those issues. So the idea of absolute objectivity never, never exists, but we're, we're trying, and I think we fundamentally have built our brand since the 1840s when we were founded on the idea that we're not a partisan or ideologically based enterprise. So if you are looking for a news source for these conversations, whether it's a legislator or a friend or just somebody that you're on opposite sides with, I, I do think, I, I don't mind sort of being the company shill and saying, you know, do, do some good Google searches and maybe find some AP stuff and find some brands that, because it, it's not that, you won't find people that say we're just a part of the liberal media. It, but it would, there are more people, because I actually get this, like I've had people at Trump rallies, covering Trump rallies, that, you know, they'll, certainly you've seen the people that would sneer when he would rile them up and they turn and yell at the press pen in the back. But there's plenty of, like, good faith, nice human beings that even go hear a Trump rally that would come up to us and, you know, who do you work for? Who do you work for? And, 
you know, somebody at CNN might get some kind of snide remark, sometimes actually mean, sometimes friendly. I had plenty of people say, oh, I actually read you, you guys. I actually trust you guys. And these are self-selecting Americans that would go to a Donald Trump rally. So anyway, I, there, there are some sources out there I think that you could try to bring to bear and on your social media platforms and your conversations. Uh, try, to, try to find some of that and, and circulate it. And I'll go ahead and, you know, curry favor with the press that, um, so, I mean, but I think one of the, one of the things about this sort of forgotten people, right, there are people who do, there, there is, the, there is this sort of thing of, well, you know, we feel like we don't matter sort of dynamic that goes on. And the thing I do appreciate and why we always try to get into the, get the AP reporter to our events is because they are in all the, so the small papers around the state rely on the AP for, you know, for the news. And so do a lot of the um, television stations that are in, and radio that are in these smaller markets. So it is a really important source of information when you get outside of the, of the big metro areas. And I think we forget now how, like, Atlanta is now this super global, you know, very, you know, kind of elite community now. That, um, and it is, um, and so I think it's, it's really important, you know, that there, there are organizations like, you know, AP that do cater to the smaller markets and give them, you know, reasonably accurate information. I just to go back to the young man's question, I think you were expressing some frustration that when you encounter people that you want to have a dialogue with, it's very difficult to do that. Uh, there's no magic answer to that. I would suggest you adopt maybe a couple of pieces of philosophy that I have learned. I think I'm the oldest guy here, but anyway, I'll, I'll play the old geezer card. <laughs> Anyway, uh, there's a couple of things I would just offer you that maybe you can use in your own interactions. Number one, recognize that, that politics, we as human beings have evolved over the eons, and politics is what we do today instead of fighting each other and killing each other. So it is an adversarial game. Just be willing to accept that. And, you know, the the... the the principle that we have to follow if we're going to make representative democracy work is understanding that the secret is to find the vital center and to govern from it. And whenever you're in a dialogue with somebody, try to pull them back to that. How do we, who, who see things differently, find that vital center because we got to. If the center doesn't hold, and by the way, it barely held when they, they attack the Capitol and try to try to overturn the election. But the center did hold, it usually will. But we, we who I think of ourselves as reasonable people have to keep that up most, most in our minds so when we encounter people who, who are very different politically than us, bring that into the conversation and see if that doesn't find a way for you and that other person to seek common ground. I think that's very important in our personal relationships to try to do that. How do you sell that, like, the concept of like a center to someone if like the option is between like life or like, certain policies? That option could be, you know, at least from the perspective between life or death, or between being recognized as a full citizen, or you know, whatever, versus not. How do you sell? Okay, hey, yeah, that person needs to now come to the center with somebody who's basically, you know, how do you find the center with someone who's basically saying, yeah, we want to feed you to the wolves or something, you know, if that's how you were viewing. I'll, I'll give it. I mean, I see. I think that's where this whole issue of an incrementalism comes. I, you know, in in my old age, I'm I am a incrementalist, and the reason is the law of unintended consequences. Like when you make big trans, when you do big transformational things, you don't really you don't know what the fallout is going to be. But when you know, when it's sort of like the you know in football you know the ground game right you're going to get you're not going to lose the ball you know you throw that great big hail mary pass it might get intercepted right so you know so i think it's seeing that it's not you're not giving out giving up what you hope to accomplish 
but you're, you know, but you're going to make progress, right? You're better. So if you're, you know, if you're meeting in the middle, then you're better off than you were. And you know, it's not that you set you stop working for this sort of next level and next layer of it. And I think that's one of you know, it's one of the things that you know I, I really want us to get, you know, kind of get the message out to you know young people of Georgia that you know the Black Lives Matter movement made change. It made very important change, and it will be over. I will say that with you know the, with um, over time, you'll be able to really see it, but. Um, you know, it's, it's incremental change, you know, electing a sheriff is like not a sexy thing, but it's completely transformational when you have a sheriff in Cobb County now that's having me, it has a Latin, Latino liaison that goes into the community that meets regularly with the members, that he has an open door to members of the community who wants to, you know, create opportunities for people in the jail. He doesn't want anyone in his jail to ever come back. 